All right, so today we're talking about chapter eight and the value and extended arguments. And what that really means is that you're going to be looking at how to really judge what a more, I guess, realistic argument would look like. A lot of the arguments we've done or, or talked about have been very small, simple examples. But what happens when we're looking at something that is more like a paper? And this is gonna be really helpful coming up because in the midterm, you'll be writing your own paper. And you're gonna be constructing your own extended argument. So let's take a look. So like I said, essays are good examples of extended arguments. You're putting together a strong thesis, which is a type of conclusion, and you're kind of trying to back that up with some sort of uh, evidence, right? Some sort of uh, points that you're making in order to prove that particular conclusion. So sometimes a simple description, just describing the situation can convince somebody one way or the other on an issue, or just, you know, narrating, just letting them know what's going on. Um, but what we're gonna be looking at also is where it's much more direct. And so I would maybe liken this to uh, court cases, where you have a lawyer who comes into the courtroom and they're gonna argue, uh, she or he is gonna argue a particular case. They're trying to prove something. And they're gonna to try to do that with evidence, right? So when you're constructing a thesis, like I said, a thesis is the conclusion to the argument. So how are you gonna prove that thesis? How are you gonna prove that conclusion? Well, you're gonna use your various reasons or premises to support that. And so we've looked at some examples like modus ponens, right? where you're taking particular premises and you lead to that conclusion. But how do you do that in an essay? So what you should start with, and this is a, a lesson that I give all my students, is that in a thesis paper, when I ask you to write a thesis essay, uh, you want to start with a thesis. You don't want me to guess where you're going, what's the conclusion going to be. It's very different from writing a story. The story is kind of like, well, you're going to leave it to the, to the last moment, right? There might be a twist or something. You want to keep the person guessing. The, this is the opposite of that. Instead, you want them to know exactly where you're going from the very beginning and then help step by step to show them how you got there. So here's an example uh, of a thesis. So it says, I will argue in this paper that the reasons and conditions argued by Bonnie Steinbach for the impermissibility of adultery conflicts with Aristotle's version of virtue ethics for the following reasons. Great, I know what's gonna happen here. Maybe I don't know all the details yet, but I can see and I can kind of judge what they're gonna talk about. So uh, what are they gonna argue in this paper? That the reasons and conditions argued by Bonnie Steinbach, so this person, you may not know that philosopher, but they're telling you this, the reasons that, and conditions that they're providing why uh, we shouldn't commit adultery, right? It's impermissible, right? You shouldn't do it. Conflicts with Aristotle's version of virtue ethics. So even if you don't know who Aristotle is, he's a famous philosopher, and you don't know much about virtue ethics, you can kind of put together that this person, Bonnie Steinbach, is going to be, uh, her argument for why adultery is wrong is going to be different or is going to conflict with Aristotle's version. And so, okay, great. And then they follow up with the following reasons. And then you'll include in your paper, just like this, well, what reasons are you going to use or point out to show that there's a conflict here? So 
a conclusion can be arranged in various situations, various, like it can come at the end, it can come in the middle. Uh, like I said, for a thesis paper, you want it at the beginning. And then you're going to start to think about pros and cons. And this is a technique that's used in some essays, right? Where you, you lay out, well, okay, these are the good parts and these are the bad parts. And usually, of course, you're trying to get your reader to to sway one side or the other, persuade them, right? Well, look at all the bad parts versus the good parts. There's many more uh, drawbacks, right? Than benefits to this approach. So this is why this is not a good approach. Or you can refute with a counterexample. Uh, we're gonna talk about that in a bit right now. Counterexamples is where you giving them an example or counter argument uh, to what they're saying and say, okay, I see your point, but this is what's, the problem and then you counter that with even a better point and this is what good philosophers do we, we're very good at and we've been trained to kind of think ahead we're, we're, we're working with you know a couple steps ahead what are you saying and how am i going to counter what you're saying how can i take the points that you mentioned and show you that those points aren't good points and you can see this relation to the law and being a lawyer right they're not just simply saying, well, I'm sure you'll believe me. Uh, rather, they're saying, okay, we saw their side. Well, let me give you some points why their side doesn't work. So, especially for uh, the paper that's coming up, uh, your midterm paper and your final paper, this is the kind of format that I'm gonna be looking for. And we'll talk about this in more detail when we get closer there. But to give you an overall view, Notice how the introduction is structured. You have your thesis from the beginning. You're going to tell me what you're going to argue for. Then you're going to give me reasons why I should believe that. But you don't have to give me every single detail yet. You're just laying it out that this is the type of reasons you're going to be working with. And then you're going to introduce a small roadmap. A roadmap, what that means is that you're just giving me a summary or general sort of uh, line of directions that you're going to start your paper with. So you said, well, first I'm going to give you the background and then later I'm going to introduce some of the reasons and then I'm going to propose an objection and respond to that. So you, again, in the introduction, you're letting your reader know exactly what's going to happen. Where is it going? There's no mystery to this. You don't want your reader guessing. If you have your reader guessing, uh, in a persuasive essay like this, you want to argue for a particular point, that's going to be uh, problematic because they might be guessing along different lines than you want them to. So they might be going off on something else if you don't give them the directions from the very beginning. And then you notice in the body that the summary is there. So this is where you lay the groundwork. This is what we call uh, stage setting. Maybe the reader is not familiar with the topic. So you're gonna have to uh, bring them up to date. You have to catch them up on, well, like the example I was using right now, who is this Bonnie Steinbach person? Or who is Aristotle? Why do they have different ideas? So you have to kind of let the, your reader know what the situation is first before you start laying into the argument. Once you do that, now that the stage is set, you can go into the reasons. Now say, okay, because the situation I explained, for this reason, this is why it doesn't work. And I have another reason. So especially for your midterm, what I'm gonna be looking for is at least two to three reasons that you're gonna to use to back up uh, your thesis, your conclusion. Uh, one reason is you can see it's kind of already sounds weak. Um, if you have more than three, it gets complicated, four or five. There isn't really a limit to how many reasons you can have, but I think for the purposes of the course, uh, two to three will be sufficient. And then this is really important. Once you explain your reasons, you want to entertain that objection. Well, it's that counter argument. How is, what's the other side gonna say to one of your reasons? Maybe they'll point out there's a flaw or something. So anticipate that, pretend you're the other side. What would they say? And you explain that, say, well, my opponent would say, or somebody who doesn't you know, accept my thesis would say this. 
they would argue that reason number one isn't a good reason because, and then you would go with the rest. Now, probably for this uh, essay that's coming up, you probably already, it'll be mandatory that you have to provide an objection to at least one of your reasons. Now, if you want to actually give me uh, objections to both your reasons, and this is the important part, the counterexample to that, the response, and you have an answer back to those, that would make even a stronger paper. So people, I think, uh, sometimes when they're learning to write, they misunderstand that, or that, well, you're saying all these bad things about my side, so it's making me look really bad. Well, hold on. Actually, you can turn it around. What you can do instead is, if you have an answer to all those objections, if you can give them a response to every single one of these, then actually in the end it's a stronger paper because you're answering all the people's doubts. Somebody might doubt you here and somebody might doubt you there. And if you can give them an answer to everybody, no one has any more doubts about it, you come out as even a stronger conclusion. And that's what you're going to do in the end. You're just going to re like kind of reassess and summarize exactly and show why your conclusion is a strong conclusion based on what you showed in the body. Now, that 80% of the work is here. This is what I've been taught as a, when I was going to school, and I think it's uh, still very relevant, that outlining, planning your paper out is the best thing to do. It's where most of the work is. The better you plan it out, the better your paper will be in the end. So you can, in your writing, that comparison of alternatives is, is effective. That's what I'm saying about with the counter arguments. Okay, well, they have an alternative view, but how does that alternative view fall apart? How is it not the best view? Uh, you can appeal to experts, right? That's also good too. So I say, bring in some statistics, show us evidence, some data that, that goes to your favor. So there's a really a, a whole variety of methods that you can use. It's not simply just one approach. So these are, all, it's kind of like I'm giving you a toolbox and you're deciding what tool is the best, is best for the job. So when you're reading somebody else's paper, and this is what I do when I grade, I'm looking for your thesis right away. What's your conclusion? What is this whole paper about? That's why I said it should be in the beginning. Um, if you're not making it obvious, if it's kind of like vague, this, these are not helping your argument. This is not helping your overall persuasive argument. Um, I'm going to have more doubts. I, mean, well, I can't find your thesis. I'm not sure what you're trying to say. These are things you don't want your reader to do. Uh, implied premises are really important here. So sometimes an argument is implied. And you can't see exactly. There is what we talk about in five premises is that they are making some some background assumptions, and they didn't really explain everything, or they already assume that you believe certain things, and they don't want to have to explain it. But this is where, uh, as philosophers, we're really good at picking those things out, uh, because sometimes those assumptions aren't good assumptions. So here's an example. Uh, the, at the bottom, the use of condoms is completely unnatural. They've been manufactured for the explicit purpose of interfering in the natural process of procreation. Therefore, the use of condoms should be banned. And this is an argument that you can see historically has been used. Well, take a look at the, the, the conclusion. Where's the conclusion? What's our thesis here? Well, there's a key word here, therefore, right? It's saying, well, this is the end. This is where I want to point out. Where do they want to point out? They want to say the condom should be banned. Well, why would you ban that? What are their reasons? They first they say the use of condoms is unnatural. Okay. And then they say, well, they've been made for interfering in the, in the natural process. 
But then think about it for a second. Is that enough to convince us that it should be banned? Why would we ban something in the first place? What are they leaving out? What are they assuming? Well, what they're assuming here is that when we ban something, we've evaluated, we've already put out that it's bad, that it's wrong. But they've never proved that anywhere in, in the argument, have they? They've just made that assumption. So that's an implied premise. They're saying that it, condoms are wrong, they're bad. Well, why would they be bad? What, how does that relate to the rest of it? Well, they said that it's unnatural. So what is the assumption that they're making? They're making the assumption that anything unnatural must be bad. And that's another implied premise. So implied premises are not obvious. They're not here. You're looking for what they call reading between the lines, what the person is not saying, but assuming. So the first assumption is that anything unnatural is bad. And the second assumption here is that anything that's bad should be bad. And those they are statements that they haven't demonstrated. They didn't write those down and they didn't prove those. So this is why this argument is, is not a good argument. Now I have another example here. Um, this is actually a real life example from a newspaper. In this uh, passage that I got from a newspaper, there's an opinion piece in it. And this is about a case called uh, regarding Marlis Munoz. Uh, she was a medical provider. She worked in the medical field. And she had agreed, uh, she saw a lot of cases of people going to comas and to vegetative states. And she had talked it over with her husband uh, many years before this incident happened that if, it, if she was ever in that type of situation where she would be in a vegetative state, she couldn't be revived from a coma, that she, her, her um, wishes was that she would be uh, put off of, uh, of life support. And her husband agreed, if ever that was the case, then he agreed to do that. Well, unfortunately, that did happen. Uh, she had a situation, a medical situation, where uh, it affected her central nervous system. Uh, she was what we call clinically brain dead, and she was in a vegetative state. However, what complicated things uh, legally and socially was that she was pregnant at the time. So what to do with the fetus in that situation? So this paper has an opinion. It says this writer is saying that medical experts agree that trying to bring the fetus to term in a dead body is highly experimental. The right to say no is a fundamental right governing any and all experimental interventions. In addition, sadly, there's a good chance that when the mother went without oxygen, so did the fetus, and thus a strong chance that the fetus is in poor health. The legislator ought not be compelling a husband and family if they do not wish a pregnancy to proceed facing long odds. What's more, the Texas legislature has made no provisions for paying for the care of the fetus or the care of Marlisa's body, which in an ICU might run to $10,000 a day or more. The situation in Texas is both illegal and immoral. If Marlis Munoz is dead, then the hospital should have released her body to her family weeks ago. The legal system should ensure that this happens. So you can tell there's a law in Texas that says that doctors have to do their everything within their power to help a fetus. The way these particular doctors interpreted that in this case was that they were going to try to go forward with the um, with the pregnancy, even though she was clinically brain dead, and that there are signs that the baby wasn't or the fetus right wasn't doing. Uh, well in the first place. Now, what's the conclusion here particularly? Where do you spot the conclusion? Well, I started looking at this and there's a lot of stuff going on. They're talking about the ICU, they're talking about uh, what's the odds of, of a successful pregnancy and, and how it's experimental. So they're actually talking about a lot of different issues in one paragraph. When you split it up, and this is what I did, 
I started to sort of buy the topic and I saw to see, started to see that while they have some good opinions about some stuff, they never really gave solid evidence, uh, conclusive evidence for any of them. They kind of left all of them a little bit open or just kind of maybe bringing it to your attention, but not giving you uh, a clear, solid argument. So this is the tricky part. When you're reading something, you need to find and identify where is the argument, what are they trying to conclude, when are they talking about stuff that's relevant, and when are they talking about stuff that's uh, irrelevant. So this is a rule that I think is really important. The rule is an argument can only have one conclusion at a time. So you can't have one argument lead you to two different places, two different conclusions. That would be very confusing. But that doesn't mean you can't have two, more than one conclusion going on in a paper or something like that. But then that means that if you have two conclusions, you must have two arguments, right? Two separate arguments. The example up here in the first box, all women are moral and rational. Andrea is a woman, so Andrea is rational, so Andrea is moral. We actually have two conclusions, number three and four. So that means we have, what? Two arguments. The first one would be that from one and two, we know that all women are more than rational. Then we can conclude, well, she's a woman. Okay, we know that. And that leads us to the conclusion, well, then she must be rational. If one is true and two is true, then three makes sense, right? Well, how do we get to four? That she's moral? By the same path. Notice, we can use the same reasons. If one is true and two is true, then four would be true as well. But they're two different arguments. So one and two to three is one argument, and one to two is four is another argument. So I highlighted in blue, uh, the first argument, one to two, gets you to three. And I underline the second argument, one to two, gets you to four. Now take a look at the bottom one. Killing ch children is evil. Children were being killed in Bosnia. Therefore, someone was doing something evil in Bosnia. When someone does something evil, he should be punished. So whoever killed children in Bosnia should be punished. Notice what's going on here. Again, we have two different conclusions. The first one we can see from some clue indicator words, therefore, right, again. And so is used as, a, as another form to identify your conclusion. So from how do you get to three? Well, if you notice, one and two leads you to three. But how do we get to five? Well, guess what? One through four will get you to five. Notice what happened here. Number three was the conclusion before. But I said only one conclusion per argument, right? Well, what do we do with the second argument? That conclusion, number three, is no longer a conclusion. It's a premise now. It is a reason. So we can stack arguments on top of each other. We can have more than one argument. And they build to larger. And you see this also in math as well, where you solve one small problem, but you use that answer to help you solve a bigger problem. So find the thesis. That's what you should do right away, especially when you're reading the paper. What are they trying to prove? Uh, if they don't have a thesis, that's actually a big red flag to tell you, well, then they don't really have an argument. Uh, it might be just a bunch of opinions, but there's no clear conclusion to it. And so keeping your eye on the thesis and then going back to it. So if you find a thesis, is this a good argument? We'll go back to the thesis. Is you know, the reasons that they're explaining really backing up what they're trying to conclude? If it has nothing to do with what they're trying to conclude, you can see that the argument is falling apart. So find those reasons, look for them. Um, you want to keep track. It gets complicated sometimes, like the Marlis Munoz example, where you see a lot of different stuff going on. They're talking about a lot of different issues. So 
keep tabs of where the conclusion is and where your premises are. And I'll show you some techniques to do that. And so then you start identifying the evidence. That's what you want to do, right? You're looking for, well, how are they going to back it up? Are these reasons, where are the reasons and where is the extra information? And you see this, in, and again, I bring an example from math, word problems, right? When they give you numbers, are all the numbers important? That's a judgment call that you're going to have to make to tell what is relevant information and what's extra information. And then what you want to do, what are likely objections, right? Like I was saying right now, okay, so what could be wrong with this? Once you understand the reasons and once you understand the conclusion, where could you see a flaw in there? Where can you see it going wrong? And like I said in five, if it has nothing to do with the thesis, if it's just extra information, ignore that. That's not relevant. That's that shouldn't be used in your evaluation when you're trying to judge whether this is good or not. Now, a good way to do this, and I want to show you, is a counterexample method. What a counterexample method does is that it tells you whether an argument is valid or invalid. Valid. So, or is the structure of the argument good? Does it flow? Does it lead you to that conclusion? Or is there, are there counterexamples? Could there be a potential problem? So you know from a valid argument structure from before, it's impossible for valid argument to have true premises and a false conclusion. If it's a really solid structure, it should lead you to the right true conclusion. If it somehow the conclusion can be false, even if what you told me was true, then that tells me right away that that's not a valid structure. That's not going to give me, uh, convince me that that is the conclusion. There could be another conclusion. And that's what you're doing with your counterexample method. If I'm arguing against somebody else, I want to show that, well, wait a minute, I see maybe they have some good points, but that doesn't mean it's that particular conclusion. And I'll give you an example here. So it says, if capital punishment deters crime, then the number of death row inmates will decrease over time. So capital punishment, right, is when you execute somebody for a particular crime. And they're going to say that, well, if there's capital punishment in place, we can execute somebody for a crime. That will deter crime. That will scare people away from committing any crimes. Then the number of death row inmates will decrease over time. And that's going to be a result, right? So that the number of death row inmates will going to go down because people will be too scared to commit any crimes. And then they point out, well, we looked at the numbers and what did they find out? The number of death row inmates did decrease over time. The number went down. Therefore, what's their proof? Or what's their, I'm sorry, their conclusion? Capital punishment is working. It's scaring people away from crime. But notice, this is what I said, take a look at that structure. Is that conclusion true because the premises, the reasons they gave were true? Or could it be false? Could there be another conclusion, right? So let's take a look. If capital punishment deters crime, then the number of death row inmates will decrease over time. So they're trying to make that relation. If you have capital punishment and it's scaring people away, the number is going to go down. And what's your second reason? Well, the number went down. But let me propose this. Could the number have gone down? Let's say it is true that the number went down. But is that the only cause? Could something else have caused the number to go down? Well, what about if they had a prevention program? So let's say that they addressed the situation way before people got into crime or entertained the idea of crime. What it has nothing to do with capital punishment. They could have a program, after school programs, you know, some sort of prevention program where people don't feel like they need to commit crimes in the first place. 
So that could be a possible explanation, right? Do they have such a program in place? Would that help bring the number down? So what I did right there is provide a counterexample. I provided an example where to show that the conclusion that is capital punishment doing the work is not necessarily true, that there could be other reasons. So when you're looking at the argument and you're evaluating whether it's a good argument or not, what are the relevant information? What are the reasons? Good writers, again, try to include just enough information to present your point of view. This is why in your paper, you don't have to tell me every single meticulous detail about everything. What you want to do instead is give me what's important to your case. So if it helps, think like a lawyer. Is this going to help you prove your case? Or is this just extra information? Is this really going to be helpful or not? And consider tone and emotive language like we talked about before. What's the tone of your argument? What are you proposing? When you're reading somebody else's argument, did they, what is their tone? Are they using emotive language? Are they trying to manipulate it or say it in such a way to, to make you lean one way or the other? Those are things that you need to consider both in your writing and reading other people's arguments. And then when you come to the evaluation part, where you say, okay, is this a good argument? You can even judge your own papers, right? That this is what you should do in a sense before you turn or submit an essay. Take a look at your paper. Are you convinced, you know? Is, did you feel like you provided a really good convincing argument? Uh, pretend you're not the person who wrote it. And read it yourself. This is what I do. Would I be convinced if I knew nothing about the subject? Uh, so you wanna look at that. Are you making mistakes? We talked about a lot of uh, logical fallacies. Uh, are you committing to those logical policies? Are you begging the question? Are you assuming you're right before you prove that you're right? Um, slippery slope. Are you making exaggerations? Are you assuming that if one thing happens and another thing happens and everything's gonna fall apart? So are you jumping to conclusions? Things like that are things you should ask yourself. And what sort of reasons or evidence might change my mind? So when you're trying to build some good reasons, ask yourself then, is this really good evidence? Is th would this be a reason that I would change my mind if I thought a different way? If it's not, then why would you use that reason, right? If it's not convincing to you, then why would you uh, attempt to use a reason that you wouldn't even be convinced by? So ask the appropriate questions. Um, think about what is good justification? What is good proof for something? Does the real, like I said, does the reason really defend the thesis? Is it really helping you? Or do you even, can you even tell in your own writing, well, that it really isn't that good of an argument. Or is it really that good of a reason? Uh, if you need help with that, that's what I'm here for to help you flush out your best reasons that you can provide. Um, do the facts seem plausible, right? Given the background beliefs. So, you know, if you present some facts, are they, is it a good reputable source? Does it seem like it's fake news? You know, things like that. Um, when you're bringing that relevant information with the bear, what they mean is that you're you're bringing it forth, you're bringing it in front of you, and you're going to present that. Divide that out of the passages that are argued for this and those that are not. And this is good when you're evaluating somebody else's argument as well, is that break it up when you're reading something. Uh, where do they have some points, right, for and against their position? Uh, do their background beliefs really support, right? If they believe they're against the death penalty, but then later they argue for the death penalty or they say something like that. Notice they're already contradicting themselves. That something doesn't quite make sense. So be mindful of that. And on your own papers, don't contradict yourself in your own paper in the sense of uh, 
then it's unplanned. If you didn't, then you did it by mistake. Uh, of course, like I said, you would have an objection and you would try to give an answer to a possible, so you're pretending you're somebody else and you're giving uh, argument against yourself. That's fine if you have an answer, right, in response. But what you don't want to do is accidentally, when you're writing, uh, contradict yourself in the process. And I've had some students do that in the past. So keep in mind where you're going. Um, when you're also uh, examining and summarizing somebody else's argument, you're looking at the paper, you're breaking it down, then don't just read the material. This is an active part. Take notes. Read it more than once. I have to read stuff more than once as well. When I'm analyzing some difficult philosophy or is really intense reading, I can't just skim through it and go, oh, okay, I got it. Rather, I say, well, wait a minute, do I really got it? And I read it a second time. I'm like, oh, I didn't catch that the first time. And then you start taking notes in the margins. And you start identifying, oh, okay, this is the important part. This is their actually their strongest reason. This is their weakest reason. This is going to help me later when I put it together and say, okay, what was their argument really about? Uh, and like, that's what I said. If it helps you, if you like law shows or things like that, uh, think like a lawyer. Is this going to help your case? And these are going to be the good reasons that you want to bring up. So organizing your argument, structuring it in such a way. Uh, sometimes it's helpful, especially when I'm writing something, to put it in a shorter form before I start writing. This is why I said about outlining. Break it down so that you understand all the parts of your paper before you start just typing away. Because sometimes we'll get ourselves confused later and we'll lose track and then, you know, it gets confused and say, oh, did I talk about that before? Oh, I don't remember. And then, you know, should I talk about it now? And it, it gets really messy. So try to organize it in such a way. Notice what I did here with the modus ponens example, right? Uh, I have my premises first and my conclusion last, my thesis, right? And I put in this format first before I start writing, then I know what how to keep track later once I do start writing. So organize the argument. Uh, like here, right? It says, if John can build in self-defense, then he did not commit murder. Well, that's premise one, right? He did act in self-defense. That's the second point that they're trying to make. That's premise two. Therefore, he did not commit murder. Well, then, that must be the conclusion. So if P, if he killed John, if John killed Bill in self-defense, that's going to be P, then not Q. Then it can't be murder. It's not murder, right? He did act in self-defense. That's a fact. So, therefore, it's not murder. Notice I used the structure from modus ponens, and I have a clear conclusion. And you notice it sounds like a court case. This could be a court case, right? So, is this a good argument or not? Are there other reasons? This is where you start evaluating. The premises, are the premises true? Is there something I can provide, like a counterexample of the conclusion? Could it be something else and not murder? That's, you should think about that. So summarize the argument, put notes in there. Is it convincing? Do they have good reasons? Um, is it, this is where a lot of the stuff we talked about before, fake news, uh, assumptions, implied premises, like we talked with the common example, are there things that they're assuming in the background that they didn't really provide evidence for? And to diagram your argument is helpful sometimes. And so I'll share this type of approach. Uh, this is a particular approach some philosophers or, or writers use. Make it, if you're a visual person, make it into a diagram. Turn it in from words into a diagram to help you keep track. So number and label all the claims. So if you see any claim or premise that they're trying to make, then put a number next to it. So you can keep track of all that important stuff, right? Uh, circle the indicator word. So it says, therefore, it says, so. That's going to help you show where the conclusion is. What do you want to do next? Once you identify where the conclusion is, underline it twice. Keep track so you know where you're going. 
And then you can underline the premises once. Where, where are the reasons for that? What's the relevant evidence? And then you can just cross out or black out any irrelevant stuff. So that's where I say extra information, stuff that's not really helping to that conclusion. You can just cross it out because it's not really relevant. And then the diagram, I'll show you how you do this. So let's take the example, ghosts do not exist. There's no reliable evidence showing that any disembodied persons exist anywhere. Now, what's our conclusion? Our conclusion is ghosts do not exist. But notice what happened here. The conclusion is in the beginning, not at the end. So that's something that you have to be careful. When you're reading somebody else's work, they might put it at the beginning instead of the end. And that's, again, what I said with the thesis paper. You're going to put the thesis, their conclusion at the beginning. So we let's imagine that we numbered the claim. Number one, that was our first claim. Uh, our second one is there's no reliable evidence showing that any disembodied persons exist, right? And uh, so there's no reliable evidence and that disembodied persons exist, right? So what, what do we do here? We have premise, we have the conclusion, that's number one. We put a circle and the premises we put in boxes. So the, the second claim was number two. They're also saying that any disembodied person exists anywhere. Number three, and so two and three is gonna lead you to one. That's what they're trying to prove, right? So see how it helps keep track? You can use arrows. You also saw on the book two, uh, you can have claims that aren't relevant and those you can uh, cross out or you can just put an X to those arrows and say, well, no, that doesn't lead to the conclusion at all. So you can keep track of your of what's going on. Now, the, the one of the last parts we're going to talk about, this is really important, is dealing with value claims. Now, there's a difference in philosophy that we talk about between facts and value judgments. And I think a lot of the confusion that's going around in the internet, uh, you can see this. I a lot in the comments boards and, and things like that, that people haven't learned the difference between facts and value judgments. So a fact is something that you can, uh, that, that in some cases are tangible in, in a sense. So a fact is that, let's say, that my screen uh, length is 15 inches or something like that. That's something we can measure and something we can try to, uh, Give some sort of tangible evidence, right? We'll give the ruler and we'll measure it out. A value judgment, on the other hand, is when I'm talking about not something being a fact in the sense of true or false, but whether something is good or bad, or right or wrong, or ugly or beautiful. Those are value judgments. Now, this is where a lot of contention happens in philosophy. Some philosophers are going to argue that uh, value judgments can be just as objective as facts, and some will argue that it's not. And there's really good arguments on both sides, and that's something I'll talk about if you're interested in my ethics class a lot. Uh, how do you make those judgments? But to understand this, I, I want to put it in this perspective. Facts are things that can be true or false. Value judgments are a judgment about something being right or wrong, good or bad, those are moral, or something being ugly or beautiful, that's an aesthetic. It's, that's a judgment about uh, beauty, right? Now, merely believing something does not make it a fact. Right? <laughs> this is, again, something we've seen a lot on social media, right? Uh, just because I believe it doesn't make it true, doesn't make it a fact. And merely believing something does not justify, right? So just because I believe it does isn't proof for anything either. So moral value cases can be problematic. So if I believe it's wrong, does it just make it wrong? Or because I believe something is wrong, do I not need any evidence other than my belief? This is where a lot of contention happens. Uh, moral philosophers are going to argue that you can come up with reasons why something is wrong. 
for why something is good or bad. So just to kind of show you what we're talking about here, some examples. So a moral statement, like I said, is saying something is right or wrong. We'll take a look at these statements here. Let's take a look at the first one. Capital punishment is wrong. Clearly, that's a moral statement, right? They're claiming something is wrong. Jane knows a lot about ethics. Well, that could be true. I don't know, Jane, but I guess that could be true. And uh, Gina should not have lied. That seems to be wrong, right? Notice then. We have three claims here, but only two of those claims are moral claims. The other one seems more like a factual claim. So Jane knows a lot about ethics. Well, that could be true or false, but that's not a moral claim. The other two are moral claims, that they're saying something is right or wrong. And that's what you'll be looking for if it's a moral argument. Where are the statements, where are the premises that are trying to claim that something is a value judgment, is something right or wrong? So how do you deal with these type of uh, statements? How do you deal with capital punishment is wrong or she should not have lied? When someone makes a moral claim, it's important to figure out what values are in question. What are they actually talking about here? So good critical reasons accept premises that contain moral only if they conform to their own moral standards. So what is the moral standard? Uh, in this case, capital punishment we talked about, right? Uh, executing somebody. What are the moral standards for that? How do we decide who lives and who dies? Based on what reasons? Those are the things you should ask yourself. Uh, you should not have lied. What's the issue here? Honesty, right? So when is honesty good or bad? When is it justifiable? Is it ever okay to lie? What are situations? These are where you think about counterexamples. Are there situations where lying might be a good thing? So those are things that you need to ask yourself when you're trying to look at these type of claims. So every moral argument should offer at least one premise as a moral statement. So if you know it's a moral argument, you're gonna to have to look in the reason is one of the reasons not a factual true or false type of claim, but a right or wrong type of claim. Take a look at the bottom here. Uh, a fetus is a person. That's the first claim you're making. Uh, we ought not end a person's life. That's the second claim. Therefore, it was a conclusion, it's morally wrong to end the life of a fetus. Well, how do they get to that conclusion? Well, from one and two, right? Now take a look at number one, a fetus is a person. Is that a moral claim? Is that a right or wrong thing? Or is that a true or false thing? This would be a true or false thing, right? They're saying what something is. They're not saying that it's right or wrong. They're just saying, they're describing and saying, well, they're saying that a fetus is a person. Now we can debate about whether that's true or false, but first they're just saying it as a claim, as a, a factual claim. The second one is a moral claim. We ought not end a person's life. They're telling us what is right or wrong there. So notice, this is what makes it a moral argument. The number two is making a value judgment rather than just giving the facts. So that's then something we should look at. Well, how do we judge whether something uh, is right or wrong with ending the person's life. Going back to the Marlise Munoz case, right? We talked about, well, it was her decision in her own life uh, if she was in that situation, right? And she's clinically brain dead, that they should pull the plug. So is it every situation that we try to keep the person alive? And there's certain situations where maybe it makes more sense to also let the fetus die, right? So this is where it gets complicated, right? But keep in mind these elements. So you can challenge them. 
We can say, well, like I was saying right now, are they, is that the best thing you can do in that situation? So when you wanna test these out, take a, another kind of backward step and look at the principles of what they're trying to claim. Uh, we ought not end a person's life. Okay, if that's the case, right? They're saying it's wrong to end a person's life. Then what about situations like self-defense? What about situations in war? Does that apply? To, would that rule apply in war? Uh, what about if I had to uh, kill somebody to save other people, right? Those are all moral claims. Those are moral issues that we want to look at. Uh, so take a look and, and kind of question those moral claims. We ought not in the person's life. Well, what are the circumstances? Are there circumstances where it does make sense? Um, those are ways that you can test out whether it's a good claim or not. And then uh, finally, ironic works. Ironic works are interesting because they're not, they're written in such a way to be ironic, meaning that they're not to be taken seriously. Actually, they're trying to get you to do the opposite. Um, but in a clever way, how do they do that? Is that they present the way that they're against as if they believe it. And if they believe, uh, and if they go along and play with that, uh, they try to show you kind of how ridiculous it is, right? The other side is, uh, the famous one they uh, talked about was uh, a modest proposal in the book. Uh, modest proposal, uh, sorry, modest proposal was written as a ironic work. So in the modest proposal it's saying, well, how do we deal with so many uh, children, uh, orphan children or, or children uh, in society? It seems like there's a lot of crime at the time. Uh, children are growing up on the streets or stealing. How do we deal with this? You know, with this overrun of children, poor children. Well, what about if we just eat them? And then it goes into a proposal about, well, we could just eat them and that would solve a lot of problems. And then we could, you know, feed people and all this. Of course, he's not serious. The author is not serious about this. What he wants to do instead is that by making fun of this situation, he's showing you that you know, when the other side, the, maybe the other side is proposing that, oh, we just get rid of the children. You say, oh, okay, let's eat them then. That would be the great thing. And of course, most of us, right, reasonable people would say, no, that's ridiculous. I'm going to eat children. And that's his point. He's like, yes, exactly. You can't just uh, get rid of people. And that's a solution to things, that you should help them instead. So that's an example of an ironic work that showing how ridiculous it is, is a way to convince people of the opposite, right? Or make them think about it. I think it's really good at in penetrating those self-serving psychological defenses. So, you know, politically, like today, we're very stuck in a certain way. Like, oh, I only believe this, I only believe this. It's Democrat versus Republican. But if we present it in a way, you know, some ironic works, it's like, okay, let's go with this and then, you know, let's go with your beliefs. But if it starts to sound like to the full extent, right? And then we try to kind of, oh, does this make any sense? And then this kind of helps people sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes they say, yeah, you know what? Maybe it, it is a little bit crazy, right? Uh, I think uh, uh, big issues like gun control and, and who can own a gun and who can not and all that. Um, some politicians have claimed that children should be able to hold guns. And this is what, where I think somebody could, you know, use an ironic work where saying, well, see, now this gun ownership thing has gotten ridiculous because now we're giving children guns. Like, this is not really uh, a solution. There has to be some rules rather than no rules. So, in the end, Remember that uh, we're having our midterm pretty soon, a couple weeks. I'll give the instructions to that, and then we'll talk about how to, in more detail, how to construct your arguments, how to build your argument, your, your thesis paper, so that you may 
provide a persuasive essay.